OK, uh, welcome back. Again, for those who haven't seen me before, my name is Vladimir Gravich. And this time, I'll be representing Barefoot Networks. And um, I'll talk a little bit about how P4 is mapped onto our device called Tefino. So the common wisdom uh, that uh, people held for a while is that programmable switches and programmable devices are much slower than fixed function devices and that they cost more and consume more power. And so that is basically the wisdom that we had to start with. And the whole goal was to overcome this wisdom and be able to build a device which is as fast, as powerful in terms of the features and as energy efficient or even better uh, than the fixed function device. In this presentation, I'll try to kind of outline some of the basic ideas that make it possible. If you are really interested, there is also a number of papers that you can read. Uh, one of them, of, of course, is the RMT paper from SICOM 2013 that uh, started the whole thing. But there are also more open papers on this design. One of the really nice things that help us is uh, a thing called Moore's Law and a very simple math that we'll take a look at. But if you look at the devices, no matter fi fixed function or programmable, there are certain th things that they have to have. There is, it doesn't matter what kind of switch you build, fixed function or programmable, you have, for example, uh, to have 30s. And so uh, just the 30s themselves take a certain percentage, about 30% of switch chip area. It doesn't matter which company you are with. You could see it's uh, open data from a variety of different companies. They all have to spend significant portion of their silicon uh, to implement 30s and other components that everyone has to have. When you look at the rest of the device, you will also see that certain things are also unavoidable. For example, you have to spend a lot of memory to implement packet buffers, to implement, you need to spend silicon to implement traffic management. And when, even if when we discuss things like match and action, there is a significant amount of silicon that you need to spend to have memory for your lookup tables. It doesn't matter if you want to be programmable or not, everyone wants to have bigger tables. And so if we <coughs> look at what's left, the packet processing logic itself actually takes not that much space on the device. It's about 20%. And not only this, the uh, amount of this logic in percentage-wise tends to get lower and lower because the processes become uh, more advanced. Everything shrinks, uh, but you know people require bigger speeds. They want to have bigger tables. So the size of the uh, ports and the series 30s and stuff like that, as well as the amount of memory, stays approximately the same. But the space occupied by logic gradually shrinks. And so as a result, even when you expand the space a little bit, the in the overall grand scheme of things, the device tends to stay pretty much the same. This is what made it possible nowadays, in 2017, let's say, to start building the devices which are programmable, but require pretty much the same amount of silicon same amount of power and everything else as the fixed function devices. It is just the technology came to this particular point. I wanted to make a couple of comments about how uh, we can look at before to build the devices which actually can process these programs efficiently. There are a couple of things that are important there. We discussed it uh, briefly during the previous presentation that uh, the current spec mandates that the execution semantics of actions and controls is sequential. So in other words, when you uh, write your code and then when it's executed and you look at the results, 
you, it should behave as if those statements were executed exactly in the order you wrote them in the program. However, in reality, network code allows you to optimize a lot of things and parallelize them. And so the spec does not say that you cannot parallelize. The spec says if you parallelize, just make sure that semantics stays the same. And so this is what I wanted to take a look with you a little bit. This is uh, the uh, picture of the PISA architecture. And it sort of might look a little bit constrained. And uh, when people were discussing before 14, where they were also some misconceptions about what PISA architecture can and cannot do. So that's what I wanted to look at with you and clarify maybe some things. So one very important detail is the single match action unit that we draw. It's actually not a coincidence that it shows uh, multiple uh, sort of independent blocks of memories and ALUs. And um, the reason is that most of the modern hardware can easily perform multiple simultaneous lookups and actions. In fact, in the hardware, typically doing things simultaneously is easier <laughs> to a certain degree than doing things one after another sequentially. This allows us to process a lot of things in parallel. And I'll look with you at some P4 programs and we'll see uh, how this can help. So in other words, every time when we show that the uh, packet goes through a match and action unit in our simplified diagrams, as I showed you on the animations before, it doesn't mean that you do only one lookup at a time. More often than not, you do a lot more. And that obviously allows you to have much more complex programs without sacrificing things like speeds and latency. The other very important uh, thing that uh, I wanted to observe with you is the fact that match and action are really two separate phases of processing the packet. And both take some time to do. How much time obviously depends on the architecture of the particular device, but nothing happens immediately. So depending on your program, when you have multiple stages and multiple match action units, you can arrange them in a different way. If the results of the computations or the actions that you perform in the first stage are needed in the second stage, and the results that are needed in the second stage are required in the, th in the third stage, for example, then we have what is called match dependency. And unfortunately, there are really no magic that you can employ. You have and make sure that these match action units execute one after another sequentially. And so if we assume that one of them can do job in one unit of time, then you will spend three units of time executing your whole program. However, there are other situations. <clears throat> For example, it might so be that the results of the actions in the first unit are not really needed to perform a match. They are also only needed to perform the action. This is a very common situation in P4. And so in that case, the stages can be staggered. It is called the action dependency in P4. And so if we do things like that, then obviously the latency of the pipeline can be significantly smaller. So I put it as two. Uh, <clears throat> what the compiler can do for us when it analyzes the flow of our P4 program, and I'll show it a little bit later on the slides, it can actually figure out how to configure those stages to optimize the processing uh, for latency, for example. And then, of course, in the best of circumstances, it might so happen that you have so many lookups that you want to do in parallel that not only you can do multiple parallel lookups in a single stage, but even between the stages, you do not really have any dependencies. So in order to execute the second stage, you don't really need anything from the first one and so on. And again, these things happen quite often in real life P4 programs. This calls for parallel execution. And I 
staggered the stages just a little bit. The reason being that in the real life, you probably wouldn't be able to achieve like latency equal to one because there is a certain time the electrons have to go from one stage to another, but probably 1.1 or something like that would be a good approximation of the latency that you can achieve between individual stages if there are no dependencies in your particular P4 program. Notice that we're still working within the parameters of the PISA architecture. So all these particular arrangements are just ways to employ the architecture. It's not any extensions or anything like that. Last thing I wanted to mention is that match is actually not something that is absolutely required in piece architecture either. For example, you can imagine a table that really doesn't use any memory and always returns a hit. So effectively, it becomes just the execution of the actions. So it becomes something like that. And one of the complaints that uh, used to be before for P414, it was a little bit awkward. Uh, in a year ago, I was showing that if you just wanted to execute an action, you had to wrap it in a table. And today, if you remember, we had a number of programs which, where you didn't have to use the tables. I showed you a couple of examples. The actions were right, right there. So P414 was forcing you to use a little bit extra characters that you had to type. And in P416, it's now all clear. But ultimately, architecturally, it is exactly the same architecture just used to its full potential. The other thing I wanted to mention is that when we build a real life silicon device, one of the challenges is uh, how to provision the resources. We only have a finite amount of these resources. And so if we do not divide them properly, then it might so be that we will not be able to build a balanced pipeline. For example, uh, one of the uh, things that often comes to mind is the disparity between ingress and egress pipelines. Some programs really do heavy processing in the ingress pipeline. Some do more heavy processing in the egress pipeline. Some have them kind of balanced, some, some do not. Today, for example, when we looked at our little programs, we didn't use egress pipeline at all. One of the best way to deal with this problem, because you don't know what kind of program your customers would like to write, is to share the resources and do the sharing through the compiler. So uh, if we look at this uh, symmetric switch model architecture uh, that now is possible through P4.16, you could see that uh, the match and action portion in the ingress and the egress pipeline, they look exactly the same. And so one of the things that they can do, they actually can share the hardware and therefore allow the compiler to allocate the resources in the way which is optimal to your program without you wasting any space in the pipeline. Let's see how some of these principles uh, got implemented in the Tofino device. Many of you heard that uh, Barefoot Networks uh, put out on the market a device called Tofino. It's a 6.5 terabit per second device in highest configuration. It's a state-of-the-art device done in the 16 nanometer technology. And here you can schematically see what this device has. So it has four match and action uh, pipelines. It has a very regular structure in that sense. In the middle, there is a shared packet buffer and traffic manager and replication engine. It supports uh, a lot of different port configurations. For example, you can have 65 ports of uh, 100 gig, or they can be converted into a lot more ports if you go down to 50 or uh, 25 gig. And it has regular interfaces, any other chip like PCIe and so on. If you look at the block diagram, that's what it is. So four independent pipelines and the uh, common shared traffic manager in between them. And so what we will see is how some of those optimizations that I previously described could be done. In P4, there are multiple language elements. And so we'll kind of look at those different language elements and see how they uh, can be mapped on Tofino. The first one we'll talk about is uh, the data that travels onto the uh, metadata bus. 
In case of Tofino, uh, we have a concept which is co an, uh, called PHV, or packet header vector. And this is a set of very uniform containers of just three sizes, 8 bits, 16 bits, and uh, 32 bits. That serves as a role of this metadata bus that I previously alluded to, and that's what carries all the data from one processing stage to another. This is sort of a reasonable approach, and that's where the uniformity and the ability to share comes in place. One of the important things, uh, how the device is designed, is that fields that, that you declared in your P4 program in the headers can be packed in pretty much any container. If you have, say, an Ethernet header, based on the circumstances, the compiler can decide to put it into six 8-bit containers, or in three 16-bit containers, or maybe one 32-bit container, another 16-bit container. Or if you have two MAC addresses back-to-back, -back, as you normally have the Ethernet packet, it can choose to, <clears throat> to use one of the containers to carry the upper bits of the one MAC address and lower bits on the 16 bits on the other MAC address and so on. So when you have such a regular structure, it allows the compiler to pack the information quite efficiently. The other thing that is important about PHV is, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, is that in the uh, match and action unit, every container also has a little ALU attached to it. So we can change any particular container independently from the others. What I'll show you in a moment is even when you have very long actions that modify a lot of fields, from the device standpoint, it's just like one cycle. It doesn't really care if it has to modify one field or two fields or 10 fields. It all can be done in parallel. And that's one of the important things that allows us to build the device at this speed. The other thing is that in reality, Tefino has this unified pipeline that I just recently alluded to. Instead of having separate ingress and ingress pipeline, they're actually joined together. And I'll show you a bigger picture how the processing happens. But exactly the same hardware processes both ingress and ingress packets at the same time. And that allows you very high flexibility in terms of how your program can be laid out. The basic processing happens, it's, uh, it's a fairly traditional way. The packets come through the max, then they are parsed, and uh, the moment the headers have been extracted, they go for the match action processing, whereas the rest of the packet continues to arrive and goes straight to the very end to the deparser so it can be assembled into, into the full packet back again. And then, of course, it goes, if we're talking about the ingress pipeline, into the queuing mechanism. And if we go into the egress, talk about the egress pipeline, it will go to the egress max. This is uh, how a programmable parser looks like. Basically, it is just a very generic structure which has nothing to do with any particular protocols. It doesn't even understand that it's parsing any protocol. It has two tables. One is a TCAM based, and the other one is the SRAM. When we encode those states, as we did when we wrote the parser program, they become uh, coded. And then what TCAM does, it matches on two pieces of data. One is the state number, and the other one is the data which comes from the Mac, for example. Or it could be also some of the previous state as well. Once the match is performed, and every time you will be matching on a different state, obviously, because you'll be transitioning from state to state, the data from the SRAM will serve as the instructions to the extraction units, and they will populate particular containers in the PHV. Here, it might be a little bit smaller font, but I wanted to show you the visualization that the Fino compiler produces when you do a parsing. So here we are in the parse ethernet state where basically it shows which bytes will go into which container. And so these are container numbers. So sometimes it's two bytes, sometimes it's four bytes and so on. And down there, there is a transition table which shows what are the values in the, uh, of the ether type in this case and how you would transition to the next state. Here is the the other state, which is, I believe, parse VLAN, 
the same thing happens. It shows you where you are in, in the packet and what are the transition rules. This is a very regular structure. In the device, we have multiple parsers because parsing is really something that is a little bit more linear than uh, the rest of the processing. So to make sure we can process things at the right speed, we have to have multiple parsers. Uh, one thing I, I was told I cannot really discuss are like particular numbers. So I had to re, uh, put N and M there. Uh, but generally speaking, um, you can parse as many bits or bytes as you have in the PHV. So typically, you can parse packets very, very deep. And it, it's mostly limited to how much time you want to spend parsing the packet. Because remember, this is a very serial thing. Before you can parse the bytes, they need to actually arrive. So the, the deeper in the packet you can parse, the later you can start. Uh, but usually the limiting number is not the number of parsing states, but the capacity of the PHV vector. Because if you think about that, right, this PHV has to travel through the whole chip and it has to be connected to each and every little device in, uh, inside. So the, the number of wires that has to connect PHV is huge. And that is one of the bigger challenges, main challenges of designing those devices. But there are no particular limitations, and most is just your program. Now I wanted to show you how the folded pipeline works, because I think that's a really cool thing. Initially, uh, the packets arrive, and I'll use this dark blue color to show the ingress pipeline. So they come uh, from the max, and they're buffered. And then they are dispatched to one of those parsers. And again, as I mentioned, we have multiple parsers, so we can serve packets at a high rate. A parser parses the packet and then goes to another one, and uh, <clears throat> that's how it goes. And then, once the packet is parsed, it goes into the match in action pipeline, which has a certain number of stages, I should say. And that's where the actual program is executed. And as you could see, these dark blue rectangles sort of show uh, which uh, containers are occupied by our metadata for the ingress packet processing. Meanwhile, as I mentioned before, the rest of the packet goes into the queuing mechanism where it will be finally assembled. So once the packet goes through the match and action pipeline, it will pass afterwards for the, for, through the deparser, and the packet will be finally reassembled and go into the queuing mechanism. And then, if you remember from our P4 uh, lecture, there's certain intrinsic metadata that also goes there, right? So the uh, queuing mechanism will send the packet later to another port or multicast and so on. And so the packet goes back. There we have egress parser, which will parse the packet again and send it into the exact same match and action units. Packet will be processed. The packet body, meanwhile, will go to the very end of the pipeline. After the deparser, everything will be assembled and sent out. So if you look at this, well, while the device is working, you will basically see two parallel threads executing onto the single match and action unit. And that's really cool because what happens is if, say, somewhere, especially in the initial stages, ingress pipeline requires a lot more lookups than egress pipeline, then you know, the ratio between this dark blue and light blue rectangles would be, you know, dark blue will dominate. And then somewhere in the middle of the pipeline, usually egress dominates. So there will be a lot more of this light blue <coughs> rectangles and fewer dark blue and so on. And so the resources will be dynamically shared in each and every stage according to how your program should behave. This basically allows us to have just one half of the hardware. So if, uh, for example, you have 10 of these uh, MAU stages, ultimately you, it feels like as if you have 20 stages overall because there are 10 in the ingress and 10 in the egress. The last thing that we have is also uh, it is possible to recirculate the packet and clone the packet, so there is a separate path that takes the packet back. 
So some things, uh, for example, uh, you can do resubmission of the packet. It's very easy. So when the packet goes through, there is a little bit which says, like, I'm in the ingress thread or I'm in the egress thread. And if you want to process the packet through the ingress multiple times, you just don't change this bit. And that's all it takes to give the packet, for example, going th uh, through the ingress pipeline multiple times. Yes? The question is, can you send the uh, packets right from the ingress parser to the egress parser? Um, there is no such thing, but what we can do is we can uh, basically tell the uh, device not to send the packet like through the uh, egress processing anymore and just send it straight to out. So it kind of uh, bypass the egress processing if you want to. So uh, make sure the packet goes through, the, through this thing only once. That's possible. What happens inside those MAUs? So if you look at that, uh, basically what we have is a number of very regular um, sort of set of devices, and I can show them basically corresponding to each, each of those memory ALU things. So the data from the PHV first go to a device which is called crossbar. And that is the, basically the multiplexer which allows us to form the key for the table. Because in the program you just say, well, I want this IPv4 destination address or I want this MAC address to be the key, but in reality it's located in one of those containers and so it has to be pulled out and fed into the table, which can be either SRAM or a TCAM. Once the match happens, what the table produces is the address of a special instruction that I'll show it a little bit later that uh, goes into the execution units and that's where the actions are executed and the results go back in the PHP and that's one stage and then you go from stage to stage to stage which can be either sequential or staggered as I explained before to implement your whole P4 program. Let's take a look at uh, some of the examples of very simple P4 programs that probably represent typical processing, at least I've seen uh, before in my life, and discuss what kind of parallelism can be achieved there. Most of the programs do have a lot of parallel pieces. So this, for example, is a very uh, simple piece of the control that uh, assigns a VLAN to an untagged packet using traditional kind of industry standard methodology. So usually there are multiple ways how a VLAN can be assigned if the packet is untagged. For example, you can assign based on the source IP address if it belongs to a certain subnet, or you can assign based on the source MAC address, uh, or you can assign based on the protocol, so you, you might want to separate, say, IPv4 and IPv6 traffic if you want to, or <clears throat> if nothing else works, you can uh, assign a VLAN based on the port. All these four lookups that you can see here, they are really totally independent. You're looking at the different fields in the packet or in the metadata, and you can put the results into separate containers in the PHV. And then all you need to do in the second stage, you can have another table which performs a resolution, for example, based on the priority. So if, for example, uh, in one application, MAC-based VLANs are more important than subnet-based, then you can assign a higher priority to that particular type of lookup. This particular control exhibits a lot of parallelism. There's four tables we can look up in parallel. So this one will consume basically two MAUs. So one MAU will do four parallel lookups, and the other one will perform the resolution. The other thing that also people typically do and uh, uh, P4 devices are kind of conducive to is uh, speculative execution. So the same thing, uh, if you really know the order of the priority, can be encoded slightly differently. We can say, let's apply a subnet VLAN table. If there, is, if there was no hit, then apply MAC VLAN table. If there was no hit, apply protocol VLAN table. And if there was no hit, then the last resort is port-based VLAN because that always works, right? You always have an ingress port to match on. If you try to do it in a trivial way, you will just use four 
stages, but that is not necessary. What you can do, you can basically do all these lookups in one stage because when you do the lookup, there is no action execution yet. And then what you will do, if one of those tables will hit, it is very easy for it to inhibit the execu uh, basically force throwing out the results produced by the other tables so they do not actually execute. This particular type of control can be easily packed in just one MAU. The difference is it's slightly less flexible than the first one. One of the things that we did is we uh, looked at the program called switch.p4 and that's a community uh, designed publicly available reference pipeline that is on the GitHub. So switch.p4, uh, if you look at it, it has approximately 100 tables and if statements overall across two pipelines. You probably are familiar, if not, I'll show you. Uh, there is a tool um, for P414 language and we'll port it to P416 as well, called P4 graphs, which shows how many stages a particular piece of code requires theoretically based on the dependencies. This particular program, switch.p4, requires approximately 22 stages divided somehow between ingress and egress. So overall, the degree of parallelism is about 4.5. And if you fold the pipeline, that means that each MAU can par execute about nine searches in parallel. So that basically requires only about 10, 11 stages of the processing to pack a program which in the text contains about 100 lookups. These are average numbers, right? So overall, between ingress and egress, we have 100 tables. They're split somehow. When we execute this or when we compile it to a folded pipeline, we see that overall it requires 11 stages. And then we divide one with the other. Very often, some of the tables that you don't need for your particular processing, they will just, you know, not fire for this particular packet. So uh, being able to process everything does not mean that you have to do everything for any single packet, of course. You are absolutely correct. The question is, can you do certain tasks in ingress or egress? So because of the way hardware is done, as you see, it's absolutely the same. It's the same hardware shared. So there is, like, if there is any particular action you should be, or anything you want to do, you should be able to do it anywhere. Now, if you look at the slides, I, I cannot go back to them right now, but if you remember the slides uh, that where we were showing the intrinsic metadata, obviously the intrinsic metadata differs, right? Because the output of the uh, ingress thread, so to speak, right? Goes into the ingress deparser and then into the uh, queuing mechanism, whereas the output from the egress thread goes into the egress deparser and egress max, but there is no queuing mechanism. So, for example, if you try to set the output queue in the egress pipeline, it wouldn't make any sense. So intrinsic metadata is different, but in terms of uh, the operations that you can execute, like can you do addition or subtraction, or can you do ifs, or can you do TCAM lookups versus exact match lookups, these pipelines are exactly the same. So the question is how many tables you can use for 6.5 terabits? You can use, the answer is you can use all the tables. You can use all the 100 tables, yes. When we say 6.4, that means that there, there is obviously a certain minimal packet size that, you, that, that we can do. It's about 160 uh, bytes. But other than that, the only thing that differs is depending on the complexity of your program, the latency might be different. So if you write the program which is very, very sequential, and has match, match dependencies from one table to another, then obviously you know, it will take longer compared to the table where you do lots of parallel lookups. And the compiler will actually produce this information for you, so when you compile the program, the compiler will tell you this is the latency of your, of your program. It's configured and that's, that's what it will be. There are different uh, things how you can calculate, uh, so we can support 64 bytes on like back-to-back -back packets on any given port, but if you try to send six, uh, 64 byte packets on all the ports in the chip, 
that's where you know you'll be limited by the minimal packet size. That's a standard practice. Question is, can you use the same table for different lookups? The answer is yes, because remember that uh, what I showed in the P4 presentation, when you perform a lookup on the table, you can use an expression. And so if you want to, you can form the key in the previous stage. So you'll pack your MPLS labels in one way, and then you'll pack your IP addresses in some other way, and feed it into the table as some generic key. And so in that case, you will, you will be able to use the table for both. The question is how you form the key for such a table. And the answer is what you do in, uh, if you go back to the presentation, you will see there are operations which allow you to use either bit slicing or bit concatenation operations to form bit strings. You remember that probably, right? There was a section on the action side. So if you want, you can form a bit string which has a little tag like zero or one. Zero meaning I have an IP address, one meaning I have an MPLS label. And then the rest of the key is either the IP address or the MPLS label. You form the key in one stage, then you feed it into the table just as a bit string. And that will allow your table to either do a lookup on MPLS or on IP. It has nothing to do with the device architecture or the language, just how you write your program. How does Tefina support parallel processing? Uh, basically two things. So one is uh, the fact that we have multiple crossbars. And so each crossbar works independently from the others. Each crossbar forms a key for its own table. So depending on how many crossbars we have, that's how many parallel lookups we can do in the pipeline. The other thing that we can do also is we can execute actions in parallel, and that's what I've alluded to previously. This is the action that I presented to you earlier in the first part of the tutorial. Here what we do is we encapsulate IPv4 and PLS. And this action looks like a fairly big piece of code, but in reality, this is a very highly parallel code because you can, for example, assign the MPLS0 label and the MPLS0XP and so on, all in parallel. You don't have to do one after another necessarily. If these fields are located in the containers in such a way that you can do parallel assignment, you can do it in one swoop. Same thing like set valid, it just sets one bit, and there is nothing that prevents you from executing this operation in parallel too. In fact, you can also uh, form the second MPLS label in parallel with forming the first one. And then even the if statement that I'm showing here, in reality, <clears throat> can be very easily parallelized. The way to do it is to use the operation that uh, ALU might support as a conditional assignment. So if this bit is set, then the assignment will go through, otherwise it will just do nothing. So this will be two parallel conditional assignments with the opposite conditions. The question is, how do you set up fields which are smaller than the container size? The answer is depends. So it depends on the particular instruction sets. But if you look at these ones, it's actually very easy to do because label EXP and boss, right? They probably will be in the same container or maybe it will be right in the same one. And so all you need to do, you basically just need to order the, la uh, to or the label with these other guys and just fill in one 32-bit container, most probably. That's what will happen or something of that nature. So it's actually very easy to do it without read, modify, write in just one swoop. And <clears throat> obviously sometimes you might need to have actions which have read, modify, write. But most of the time when, we, when you look at the practical programs that are written, this is not necessary. And that's what makes those devices possible. So if you try to design for the worst case, we probably wouldn't be talking today. <clears throat> but if you desi de design for the practical case, then everything actually works quite nicely. Sometimes you need to do read, modify, write, and so then these operations will be more expensive, and the compiler will try to split the action in such a way that it can do it for you, again, without you worrying about it too much. The question was, does every container has access to LU? The answer is yes. So each container basically has a little LU, and so the difference is one of the LUs are 8-bit LUs, the other ones are 16-bit LUs, and the 32-bit. 
So if you have the action which is too complex and sometimes, you know, in P416 it's now very easy to write an expression which is like A equals B plus C plus D plus E and so on. Well, the laws of <laughs> the nature, you cannot do anything about them, right? And so then the, the compiler probably will have to split it across multiple stages. The question is why the containers are of this size and not one bit or four bit. Uh, usually it's a matter of, uh, you know, the balance between the complexity and number of connections that you, you need to have. Uh, <clears throat> because ultimately these devices have to be laid out in the real silicon. And so there are certain design choices. Most of the fields in the networking world usually are either of these sizes or they are packed in, 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 inside size that like multiple fields fit into one of those containers. So it's quite reasonable, I think. Uh, there are definitely protocols like in VLAN, right? You have a three bit fields and one bit field and 12 bit field, but together that's 16 and so works quite nicely. This uh, visualization basically shows how the compiler views this PHP. So there's a set of these containers of various sizes. And so the nice thing about the visualizations that our compiler produces, it actually shows you a number of things. So one of the interesting things is that if you analyze the program flow, you will realize that you are not limited by just the size of the PHP because very often people ask like, okay, how big is the PHP? And they assume that that's how much stuff they can pack. But in reality, if you work smarter, you can pack a lot more. Why? So for example, say you are parsing layer four headers, ICMP, TCP, UDP, and so on. Obviously a single packet cannot have all of them. So they can be easily overlaid. And that's exactly what this visualization I believe is showing, that there are multiple fields that are packed inside the same container. And sometimes the number of fields can be fairly high. And the other thing that is possible is as the PHV goes from one stage to another, you can use the same container for different intermediate results. So if, for example, you had some variables that you used in the beginning of the pipeline of your program, you don't need them afterwards, the same container can be used for something else. Together with the, all these optimizations which are done by the compiler and just enabled by the device architecture, you can pack like several times more than the nominal size of the PHV. Back to the uh, parallel processing. So the output from the tables is actually a long instruction word. It's called a very long instruction, instruction word because basically it contains a set of instruction for each and every container that you want to operate on. So there are a certain number of this very long instruction words that we can produce. And so as long as tables do not try to manipulate the same container, and this is not allowed, you can clearly write the actions that can change the whole PHV in one swoop. That allows you to have multiple tables that can work independently as long as they modify independent fields. The actions from output from each of these tables can be combined together. Basically, they can be ORed, and then ultimately uh, you, will, you will have the result that you would like. So if one table tries to modify some containers here, the other table tries to modify some containers there, both can be modified in parallel. And that's what allows us to achieve a very high degree of parallelism. In the interest of time, I'll probably skip some of these sections. And what I wanted to show you instead is a visualization of a single MAU stage that the compiler produces. And that shows the other very important thing. You see uh, lots of blocks, they kind of have the same shape. And the reason is they can be used for a variety of things. At the very top, what you see, those squares are actually individual SRAM pages. And there are a variety of letters that are printed on top of these squares. Uh, the color corresponds to different tables that we place, or those might not necessarily be tables. You can use SRAM non, not only for tables, but you can use SRAM for things like counters and meters and registers and other things. Or for example, if you have a TCAM table, obviously you need TCAMs there uh, 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 depicted here. 
but the action data still is stored in the SRAM. So this is, becomes a very regular structure that is easy for the compiler to work with because all you have is a certain set of memories where you just need to uh, pack things. If you want to do some other things that the control plane usually requires, like for example, you want to save the state of the chip and restore the state of the chip, you don't have to think about what tables are defined or anything. You just can go and download certain amount of SRAM or TCAM blocks into the memory and that's basically saves the state of the device. In this diagram you could see the crossbars. So these are the crossbars for the exact match tables and these are the crossbars for the TCAMs. These are the TCAMs that are present in each of the stages and again the visualization if you uh, get the compiler and you mouse over you will, it will show exactly what a particular TCAM is used for. For the exact match, the data comes from the crossbars into the hash units, which can compute the hash. And so these hashes will be used to perform the exact match, but not only. For example, if you want to do other things like calculate a hash value just for your lag distribution, or you want to calculate a hash because you wanted to have some flow ID or stuff like that, again, you would use exact same piece of the hardware. So it's highly reusable, just building blocks which allow you to do whatever you need to do in the program. And then of course we have uh, these SRAMs, some of them are used to match and some of them are used to contain the actions and the action data. And here are those VLIWs and again there are some mechanisms which allow us to share those VLIWs very efficiently. So the fact that there are not so many of them, you can see that they're still not fully used. And the reason is, if you think about, for example, how PHV is working, right? So the containers that are used for the ingress are not used for the egress. So therefore the instructions for the ingress and egress tables can be put into the exact same very long instruction word and can be all combined together. The question is, what is the width of the action data based on the lookup? Uh, the answer is basically it's like a union. When the compiler compiles the program, it kind of allocates the, uh, the number of bits corresponding to the, to the widest action that you have for, for that particular table. If you remember the example that we discussed in the previous lecture for the L3, right? So uh, some action didn't even have any parameters like the drop and the other one like L3 switch had four parameters. So uh, the compiler will allocate the space based on the widest action, obviously. And here's another visualization that the compiler also produces that basically can allows you to see the resource utilization in uh, both absolute and uh, relative numbers. And if it's relative numbers, they're color coded. So you could uh, see where the kind of the pressure points are. If the device is designed correctly, normally the pressure points should be SRAMs or the TCAMs. And that's, what exa that's exactly what we see. All the other resources that are nevertheless important, and if you run out of them, the compiler will have to move processing to the other stages as well. They're still important, but most of them uh, don't go into like above orange. So that shows that really the most important things are SRAMs and TCAMs, and so the, the balance is done fairly correctly. This is pretty much what I wanted to tell you when I uh, was doing a fairly similar talk uh, we didn't really publicly announce the FINA, so it was a little bit difficult to fill the questions about whether the device is real or not, but now uh, many of our customers have in their hands. It's public knowledge. Uh, the device is there. It works and very nicely. So I would say that we reached to the point where you can have a programmable data plane running on the real silicon at a terabit speed, and this time is now. And the other thing, I uh, just wanted to say in conclusion that P4 programs, if you analyze them in detail, they provide a lot of opportunities for the optimization. Every time I come to work and we realize there's yet another thing that you can do to P4 program to pack it more efficiently and do interesting things with that and that's actually what uh, <laughs> drives me and gives me a lot of uh, fun in life. So with that, thank you very much for coming, uh, for enduring me for so, such a long time. And uh, after that, we'll have some final words, and uh, then I hope there will be a reception as well. Thank you.